For me, MechWarrior 2 has been a journey that has, as of this video, taken me through nearly three games. When I began, I wasn't even sure that there was a community for MechWarrior titles anymore. Honestly, I wasn't even sure that Battletech still existed after so many years away from tabletop war games. My only exposure to it beforehand had been the more recent Battletech game by Harebrain Studios. Before that, I'd merely been a younger man obsessed with Warhammer 40k, noticing Battletech's older rulebooks and pewter figures as I made my way towards my local store's display of Space Marine Forces. To tell you how long ago that was, if you couldn't tell by the fact that those figures were made of pewter, the series' older black and orange color scheme was still being used, something I'm sure that many watching this video remember seeing in person as well. Yet, here in 2024, the series still remains strong. Several decades of intricate lore have been ingrained into the lives of many, while others have made entire careers off of this lore or the materials of the tabletop game itself. Strictly completing the MechWarrior games week by week, I'm never going to be able to achieve the level of knowledge that so many of you have, even as I near more recent series entries. Though, through this experience, I've managed to get my proverbial feet wet, going so far as to obtain the novels and even the Battletech set itself. I have plans on expanding as time goes on, perhaps even venturing into the tabletop world for this channel. Atop that, I've been clued into the deeper mechanics of the MechWarrior games themselves, learning to group weapons and combat maneuvers beyond simply outfiring the enemy. All of this is undoubtedly thanks to all of you, and has made my venture through MechWarrior 2's standalone expansion, Mercenaries, far more interesting than I would have ever imagined. While the base game and its expansion, Ghost Bear's Legacy, centered around three of Battletech's clans, Mercenaries instead brings things back to the Inner Sphere. Here, the setting is far different. As clans were the descendants of a long-lost self-exiled Star League military force, a mindset alien to those of the Inner Sphere was developed. As can be seen in MechWarrior 2 and Ghost Bear's Legacy, clans have become more tribalistic, with their society completely centered around developing the most efficient warriors possible all in efforts to retake Terra, aka Earth, which also happens to be the center of the Inner Sphere. Within the Inner Sphere, the Perforary, societies have been shaped by a series of feudal empires, each controlling hundreds of planets, though seemingly forever locked into war. All of this tying back to both the formation and eventual dissolution of the Star League. As conflicts tend to last hundreds of years, the Inner Sphere's many societies have resulted in thriving war economies. This, and lucrative opportunities for those mercenaries who wish to profit off of the Inner Sphere's endless conflicts. MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries begins, as all of these games have so far, with the destruction of a mech warrior, specifically Colonel Holly Harris of Team Venom. Rather than simply being a demonstration of the gameplay or introducing a faction as Ghost Bear's Legacy did, this cutscene actually ties into the game's storyline. Beginning, players are left a note by the fallen colonel, stating that they are to receive her inheritance, a measly million sea bills and a beat up commando. With only this, you are tasked with creating a new mercenary outfit so that you might make a living for yourself. Now there are so many changes to mercenaries that this could have been called MechWarrior 3 easily. Due to MechWarrior 2's initial two-year delay, tensions between Activision and FASA had grown, eventually leading to FASA deciding not to renew their contract. To keep developing on the massively successful MechWarrior series and not violate their licensing agreement, Activision kept developing titles under MechWarrior 2's moniker. So while Mercenaries would be released as a standalone expansion, it was closer to a whole new game. While designs are kept in line with MechWarrior 2, Mercenaries is a fully textured representation of the Battletech world, though textures did differentiate somewhat between Windows and DOS versions. Rather ironically, I'm playing the Windows Titanium version for this video. While it did have glitches and didn't quite work too well for me in the past, this was due to aspects of Mercenaries being wedged into older entries, or if you'd rather, older entries being wedged into the guts of Mercenaries. Many people played this edition first and enjoyed it, and though it has a troubled history, I won't harp on people playing what certainly looked to be the best value. Getting all three games in one package with a new installer and updated textures, I mean, who wouldn't pick something like that up. Of all the games included, Mercenaries does work the best though, likely due to all the changes being based around it. Performance is as expected, with the frame rate bouncing up and down due to the hardware it was made for. In fact, I would thought that there was something wrong with my legacy setup since the frame rate can drop during combat, but even the original 1996 trailer showed similar game performance. 
If you've played the original 1989 MechWarrior, Mercenaries is a closer second to that than MechWarrior 2 was. It brings back elements such as contracts, hiring teammates, and the currency system. While I really didn't like how MechWarrior could leave players dead in the water with nothing at all and unable to continue playing unless they loaded a new game or a saved game, Mercenaries actually presents a game over if the player has absolutely no way to continue. Though, reading through the Battletech Primer, I actually discovered that MechWarrior's habit of leaving the player stranded with nothing is actually canon. It might seem small to applaud a game for a feature like this nowadays, but it wasn't uncommon for 80s and 90s games to leave players wandering around without a means to continue. Beginning with the aforementioned million C-Bills and only a commando mech means that the trek from singular mercenary to functional organization is both steep and completely up to the player. There is a good deal of freedom in mercenaries, which can lead to success or crushing failure. Neither can happen, however, without players inching out every little decision. Money is earned extremely slowly, with small expenses such as repairs, weapons, ammo, equipment, and even applying these customizations eating at every bit of earnings received. Saving for a new or additional mech can take quite a bit of time. You won't be able to pick up your favorite designs immediately, or get the setup you absolutely want until the appropriate funds are acquired, or a certain point in the game's timeline is reached. So if you love the clan mechs of previous entries, you're going to have to wait until clans actually make their appearance. You'll also be learning hard lessons as your career moves forward, such as the fact that repairs don't include lost weapons. If you are in the middle of a contract that encompasses several individual missions and happen to lose an arm, you can repair it, but you will not get back the destroyed weapon bound to that part. That is, unless you have a replacement in your inventory. So preparation is absolutely important here beyond having an impressively equipped mech. Sometimes, I forget that almost everything tied to the Battletech universe is absolutely ruthless. Systems like this ensure both realism and that newcomers like me are thoroughly aware of this fact. Now I'm not saying that things like that are a downside at all. Players who stick it out will find themselves deeply tied to their setups, slowly developing methods which prevent unneeded fund expenditure. It isn't surprising that nearly every person who sees this game through becomes a devout fan. In my experience, Mercenaries was the first of any MechWarrior game that had me shuffling out mechs and parts frequently. Always was I motivated to try something new, either because a tactic wasn't working or a weapon had been blown off at the end of a contract. Though massively popular, I'd never handled something like the famous Atlas, or other mechs like the Crab, Jagger mech, Hunchback, or Trebuchet. Having limited resources and getting by on a shoestring budget pushed me to take chances on new equipment. Anything that might seem like it could give me an edge in combat, not only with weapons, but engines, armor, and heat sinks as well. It is so easy to get wrapped up in the customization of mercenaries that you might just end up playing the game for that reason alone. And maybe it's a controversial opinion, but I found MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries to be one of the most involved games I've ever experienced. Yes, these systems were available in previous games, but the way this game handles them enhances immersion levels drastically. Mercenaries also contains the much lauded salvage system. This gives players a chance to salvage parts off of the mechs they've taken down. It's a really appealing system, though not so rewarding until contracts with higher salvage rights are taken. Sometimes a mech chassis can be recovered as well, which can be repaired and used by the player. I was always happy to get additional parts as rewards, certainly ecstatic when I was able to obtain a mech for either a companion or myself. Though, there is a few hiccups depending on which version of the game is played. Original versions of the game had predetermined salvage. The Battle Pack and Titanium versions have an upgraded dynamic system. Predetermined means that no matter what mechs are destroyed, you're likely to get some salvage depending on the contract rights, though from a list determined by the game's creators. The dynamic system is just a way of saying RNG before RNG was a thing. Maximum salvage comes from a battle mech failing to explode, which is completely random. You still get parts at times from a destroyed mech, but what is left tends to be useless or damaged. Though before I put my foot completely in my mouth about Mercenary's salvage system, I'm sure there are those of you watching that have developed some excellent strategies to take full advantage, so feel free to put them in the comments below. I'm honestly curious. As I mentioned earlier, the ability to hire additional mech warriors to assist you during missions has been brought back. 
Likely, this system's absence was due to the clans not being the sort to hire outside forces to do their dirty work. You can also hire Aerotech pilots who always bring their own units, however, they are also the most expensive to hire on. For mech pilots, you will have to bring the battle mechs yourself. This can be a hard expense when you're in need of something more functional, or want the funds to bolster your own mech setup. Companion AI can also be a bit hit and miss. Oftentimes, they'll only follow you part way before wandering about, or get caught on a piece of scenery. A Starmate command system does exist, but it leaves a little bit to be desired. Everything involving currency can be completely bypassed as well. By choosing to start the game without an economy, mercenaries will progress in a fashion more closely resembling Mech Warrior 2. Personally, I didn't like this streamlined version of the campaign. It removes all of the shop sections, contract selection, and replaces all of this with the Mech Lab. A major problem I had with this and every other version of the Mech Lab was that it didn't allow for the option to preset weapon groupings. This was something that I had barely been aware of when playing Mech Warrior 2, as I didn't have any experience with the games or or own the physical manual. Thankfully, a lot of commenters let me in on its benefits. Mercenaries includes a section to set these weapon groupings, allowing for more powerful firing combinations when grouping mode is selected during combat. You aren't going to survive this game without knowing something about it. However, with the economy turned off, this menu option doesn't exist due to it being within the office and mech bay, which are closed off in this mode. Mercenaries is a difficult game. Here, the enemy AI has been amped up. Damage values have also been changed, more closely following the Battletech rule set. Almost always, you'll be outnumbered, resulting in an astounding amount of close call battles. So, for those who want a little less salt in their wounds, grouping can help. Manually inputting it at the beginning of each level, which you have to do with the economy is off, just makes the whole system tedious and easy to forget when you're new to the series. Of course, everyone is itching to know the lore of this game and where it falls into the greater Battletech universe. While I'm happy to throw a bit of the story out there, do take note that my knowledge of the lore is limited. I'm a beginner, and aside from these games, scattered wiki entries, YouTube videos, Battletech Primer, and Decision at Thunder Rift, I don't know as much as I'd like. So if I happen to not say much pertaining to certain century-long wars, it's because I can't confidently provide you with a detailed amount of information. Of course, in my eyes, there are two ways this can be taken. Either this video might help get people to play MechWarrior games and move along to the Battletech franchise, I totally suggest this option since the universe is immense and goes far beyond just the tabletop games, or all of you veterans can see this as a teachable moment. Feel free to fill me in on the greater details below, because I can't seem to get enough of what this franchise is all about. Anyhow, Mercenaries follows a timeline that predates MechWarrior 2, specifically between the years 3044 and 3052, beginning at the tail end of the Succession Wars and leading into the clan invasion. For more than half of the game, stories come from the contracts chosen, put out by the Draconis Combine, the Federated Commonwealth, Comstar, and the Free Rasselhag Republic. Only contracts pertaining to key events are mandatory, but tend to be few and far between until later in the game. Contracts and their storylines range from attacking or defending against pirates or the rival houses of a contract giver, all the way to light espionage, escapes, and even protecting an eager prince. Randomly generated missions are also thrown in, meaning that, for the most part, what you do is up to you. There is no real faction relation value that prevents another contract from being taken either, so you aren't going to be making enemies by siding with a rival. Instead, the availability of missions is determined by the progression of time. If you take on a mission from the Draconis Combine and its timeline overlaps that of a Commonwealth contract, then you won't be able to do the Commonwealth contract. This not only allows for a lot of replayability, but it also makes contract selection a little bit less stressful. No choice ever feels like a wrong choice. As you continue your career, there are news articles to gleam through, showcasing the Inner Sphere's many happenings, and occasionally letting the player know that something new is available for purchase. Sometimes the outcome of a previous contract is mentioned as well, which is really cool, helping to show that your actions have an effect on the universe. Completing contracts, accumulating resources, and building effective strategies is honestly the majority of what this game really is about. Story occurs mainly through the contracts given, expressed as journal entries depicting close brushes with important Battletech events. Well, until the clan begins their invasion, that is. 
Yes, I'd go so far as to say that this game doesn't have a primary storyline until the clans make their appearance. You'll certainly be taking part in some interesting scenarios, but that really is all it is until they come rolling in. From here, everything begins to gel into a more cohesive narrative. Initially, they appear as an unknown mech group, one that the news can't possibly believe in, and even dismiss as nonsense. Eventually, amidst a contract, you'll find yourself ambushed by the clans, Clan Wolf specifically. Destroying your dropship, they'll take you hostage and, because your own battle proudness has been shown, they'll decide to take you as prisoner. In my previous video on Ghost Bear's Legacy, some disdain was shown for a mission where a custom mech had to be piloted underwater. While I enjoyed it, I can see why some didn't. Here, the equivalent of that mission is that in which the player must escape a clan holding in a hover tank. Now, I'm not versed in all of the Mech Warrior games, but so far, I have to say that this one might just be the worst mission in any of the games thus far. Unless there is some idea as to where a certain dropship is, a lot of time can be spent wandering around. You are only told that it can be found at one of the many nav points scattered around the area. The first time I did this, I went so far that I ended up looping back around to the holding area. It was certainly fun to pilot something new, like the hover tank, but not in this way. Several campaigns against the clans follow this, some of which dip into Battletech's lore. One being a modified version of the Battle of Wolcott, an event which took place within Michael A. Stackpole's Lethal Heritage novel. Mercenary's final mission happens to be the most lore accurate, following the Battle of Luthen. Here, the player must join up with the Draconis Combine and Commonwealth in an effort to defend Luthen itself against the Smoke Jaguars. If it sounds like I'm summing everything up, I am. This is because the game does do this as well. One thing that Mercenaries and Ghost Bears Legacy do have in common is that they both lack the vastly more detailed storyline of the base MechWarrior 2. It does make the game easier to digest, but it leaves a little bit to be desired when major events like this show up. Mercenaries does have a few issues that I, as someone who's played this game for a week straight, can't go without mentioning. No, it's nothing to do with the loose and open storyline or hard as nails difficulty. I actually enjoyed the elements that were brought back from the 1989 Mech Warrior as well. They made more sense this time around and were well implemented. Instead, I feel like the most detrimental part of this game is traversal. I don't think that in any of these games, I've walked as much as I did in Mercenaries. There is an extreme amount of time spent going back and forth, getting to mission areas, and walking all the way back to dropships. You did go back to dropships a few times in MechWarrior 2, and a couple segments had a little bit of distance. However, if a mission was across any sort of distance, the dustoff zone would always be somewhere closer to the area where the mission ended. There are a handful of instances in Mercenaries Scenarios where the mission does either have a somewhat closer dust off, dropship, or simply ends after an objective is completed, but they are few and far between. Wireframe has also been removed, leaving only thermographic sensors as an alternate vision mode. While I'm sure there is a lore based reason for this, possibly something to do with lost tech, it isn't pleasing from a player perspective at all. Thermograph drenches the world in an amber hue and provides no benefits whatsoever aside from acting as a poor man's night vision in darker environments. When frozen planets come about, it makes these snowy areas look a little… yellow. As well, since I'm playing the Titanium Edition, the known glitches are still present. They don't impact mercenaries so much, as I've said, yet one persistent glitch does remain, this being unlimited overheating. It only occurs when it comes to clan mechs. For some reason, if a shutdown is overridden in a clan mech, it won't be affected by maximum heat values. I mean, it does take away the heating system in this case, but by the point you're actually coming across a clan mech, you won't even care. It'll be a blessing, if anything. Hits also didn't always register at times for neither enemies or myself. Perhaps this was due to the further implementation of genuine Battletech rules, but it was odd to receive a missile barrage and be barely affected. Or fire four medium lasers and two PPCs at a Jenner, only to shrug off the attack like nothing even happened. Sometimes it would be the complete opposite and an enemy mech would combust on impact. I have no idea why this was specifically, but it happened quite frequently. Oh, and while Mercenaries was a bit lighter on version variation, there's a curious problem I came across. I just had to mention it before I brought this video to a close. Originally, I had obtained the 3DFX version of Mercenaries, and it worked aside from glaring sound issues and being unable to use its high rest mode. However, the surprising thing about the 3DFX version of Mercenaries is that it doesn't actually have a 3DFX renderer included. Instead, it's just a DirectX version of the game. 
This is probably why it ran the way it did for me, since DirectX 3 was a lot rougher than newer iterations. Only the Titanium version has a 3D FX renderer, and since I'm using a 3D FX Voodoo 2, it made my decision to play that version all the more obvious. Still, that had to be a massive issue for those trying to get the game running back in 1996. So here I am at the very end of my MechWarrior 2 journey. Which one was the best? Well, for me, that's like asking what my favorite cut of steak might be. They're all enjoyable, depending on what you're after. That is, unless you're a vegetarian. For me, it would be impossible not to look at all three titles as separate experiences with their own pros and cons. Each have the same underlying gameplay and similar graphics, but enough new content to make them practically sequels. And yes, that includes Ghost Bear's Legacy, which was, in my opinion, the only true expansion for MechWarrior 2. Mercenaries, I feel, is a new game, given the MechWarrior 2 title due to legal tie-ups, though your opinion might vary on that, which is perfectly valid. Anyhow, thank you so much for watching as I continue my MechWarrior Odyssey. I know this one was a little late, but I'm going to make sure the next one lands on Saturday as intended. I've been Keynova. Please like and subscribe for more mech-based gaming content, ideally every Wednesday and Saturday. Now go off and play some great games as I prepare to install Windows 98.